أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا والشفيع نفسنا حبيب إله العالمين ولا حبيب إلا هو وأحله الذي سمى في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأب القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وآل محمد أسيكم أولا بإباد الله بتقوى الله before I begin I advise all of my sisters and brothers to have taqwa in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have God consciousness and to keep in mind the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at every moment for during the month of Ramadan the ultimate goal of these nights and days is to attain the sense of taqwa the sense of God consciousness whereby we feel the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at every moment and at every juncture during the course of our lives. And with regards to fasting, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kutiba alaykum as siyam kama kutiba ala ladina min qadlikum la'allakum tattaqoon. That we have prescribed fasting upon you in the same way that we have prescribed it upon those who have come before you. La'allakum tattaqoon. So that you might attain this God consciousness, this notion of taqwa. But though this word is often thrown around many a times, it's often something that people feel is very distant. How can I truly feel the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at every moment or at every juncture during the course of my days? Our lives are often filled with so much distraction that we're busy with work, we're busy with school, we're busy with family and other relationships and whatever, that often take us away from feeling or seeing God at every moment during the course of our lives. The idea is to understand that it's a long journey. It's not something that happens overnight, it's something that requires focus and diligence. It's something that requires a sense of cultivation of heart because it's not about seeing God with the eyes, but rather seeing him be our hearts. And that same vein, this man, he comes to Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib and alayhi salam, and he says, oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, do you see the God that you worship? He says, and how could I worship the God that I do not see? But I do not see him with the sight of my eye. Rather, I see him with the faith of my heart. And so this notion of heart within Islamic tradition is seen as the most important vessel of the human being. And you'll find that many a times the heart is compared uh, or is almost used interchangeably with the soul within the ahadith of the Prophet and his family, uh, And there's so many a verse that speak to, again, the importance of cultivating or caring for this heart, such, again, that we're able to find God via that vessel. Because physically, like we know, there's no physical manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for he is not bound by time and bound by space. Thus, it's our responsibility to find him via the spiritual dimension and capacity that we do have, and that is that heart. As we recite in the whole Quran and the dua taught to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we say, Oh Allah, don't allow for our hearts to transgress after you've guided them. Meaning that the heart essentially is a tool that has been guided. We have raised the human being to the highest of rank because their hearts are put in place. We already have that natural ability, that innate nature toward knowing who our creator is, toward understanding who he is. But then we are entered into this world of lowliness. We are entered into this world of loneliness. We are entered into this world filled with a distraction that again allows for our hearts to tremble and for it to swerve away from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended for it. In the dua of Imam Ali Zain al Abidin, he states, Ilahi bi adhimi jinayati amata qalbi. That, oh Allah, by my own sins and my transgressions, 
my heart has died. That's why it's so difficult during the course of our lives, even in this month, for us to see God before we see everything else. We ask ourselves, why is it that I consistently get angry during the month of Ramadan? Why is it that during the month of Ramadan, in my prayers, I feel less focused and I'm thinking about food and drink all of the time? Isn't this the month where I'm supposed to reconcile for all of those spiritual challenges and obstacles and hurdles that have already been created for me? It's the fact that now we are alone solely between us and our hearts. and The heart hasn't been catered for, hasn't been cared for, hasn't been tailored. And again, like we know, I'm not talking about the physical heart that needs to you know, go through exercise and healthy eating, but I'm talking again about the spiritual heart. In a hadith from Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, he tells his companion, Kumail ibn Ziyad, in this very lengthy and very beautiful narration, which is mentioned in Nahj al-Balagha, he says, Ya Kumail, inna hadhi al-qulub aw'iya fakhayruha aw'aha. He says, O oh, Kumain, surely these hearts have the ability to be receptive. They have the ability to intake more. They have the ability to reach some sense of high spiritual capacity. And the best of those are the ones that are most receptive. So again, the capacity is there. The ability is there, right? It's like this sponge as we learn from some of the scholars of Islamic ethics, they say the heart is like a sponge. The more reflection, the more recitation of Quran, the more dedication to God, the more worship, the more service, the more generosity, it's like you're pouring water on that sponge and it's becoming softer. And the more that you do, the softer it becomes. And the more that you pour on it, even without squeezing it, it's able to intake more weight. But the sponge that you leave to the side. And though it has the capacity, you just keep it on the side and let it bake and dry under the sun, it becomes hard. Then it becomes a little bit rough. Then it becomes difficult to bend. And then it becomes even difficult to pour water on it and then squeeze all that water out because, again, it hasn't been utilized. It hasn't been occupied with any virtue, with any beauty, with any compassion, with any patience, with any love, with any generosity. So Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, That surely these hearts are receptive and the best are those which are the most receptive. I mean, they're intaking more. They are consistently allowing for it to be fed. They're consisting, consistently allowing for it to be tailored and catered and so on and so forth. But what do we do when that heart is not receptive? It hasn't been trained. It hasn't been, uh, it hasn't been in its way accepting toward divine teachings, toward the remembrance of God, toward acts of worship, toward obedience, toward fasting, toward whatever it might be. What do we do then? We got to do something to wake it up, so to say. Which is why then the hadith tell us that when that heart of yours is not necessarily feeling that desire to know God, and what we should be striving to do is plunging it and throwing it into that opportunity, you know, whereby it will be forced to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me give you an example that might help put this in perspective. Once in a while, if you haven't exercised or eaten healthy for a long period of time, you know that it's the right thing to do to exercise and to eat healthy. You know it's the right thing to do. But for whatever reason, you can't wake yourself up to go out for a walk or to go to the gym or to go and run or whatever it might be. So you allow for this procrastination to take place for days and for weeks and for months and so on and so forth. Until you realize that, hey, if I don't make a difference in my life today, I'm in big trouble. So what do you got to do? You just got to get up and you just got to walk to the gym. You just got to get up and you have to go for a run. You have to get up and you have to be active because that's just what you got to do. And it's hard that first time. Your lungs don't have the capacity. You have so much stress and anxiety thinking about what everyone else is thinking about you, right? We go through all of these emotions 
But we know that what we have to do is what we have to do because that's what's good for our bodies. Our ahadith, they point to the same reality with regards to these hearts of ours. Sometimes when we feel it struggling, sometimes when we feel it not being receptive, sometimes when we are in such a lack of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we just got to throw it into the fire and you go to visit a graveyard, for instance. And you remember your own mortality. You say, I'm going to dedicate myself even outside of the month of Ramadan. Oftentimes people, they fall into a lag, which shouldn't happen immediately after. But you got to wake up that morning and make the intention that I'm going to fast today. You got to open up the du'as of Ahlul Bayt, Sahifat al and recite these incredible supplications as narrated to us by the Prophet and his family, and you will find that immediately thereafter, your heart will be awakened. That's what all this is about. That's what this month is about. That's what this religion is about. That's what this spiritual journey is all about at the end of the day. We go through those lulls and those ups and those downs and so on and so forth. But it's about grasping to the capacity and to the potential, again, that we have within these hearts of ours. I want to move this discussion a little bit forward to speaking about the three di different types of hearts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions within the whole of Quran. And again, I'll say it again, that when we are talking about the heart within Islamic tradition, we're not talking about a physical organ within the human body. No. We're talking about a spiritual vessel, a spiritual tool that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us that gives us the ability to know him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala references, again, three types of hearts within the whole of Quran. Firstly, he mentions the hard heart. He says, He says, and woe upon that heart, which has become so hard that it's unable to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the type of heart of someone who is so negligent of the remembrance of God. They don't have any care or concern for others. They don't have any care or concern for their own selves. The only thing that they're interested in is an accumulation for themselves. And we see this manifestation and this reality present among so many a people today. What they care about is domination. What they care about is power. What they care about is wealth. What they care about is authority. What they care about is feeding themselves before feeding others. No care, no concern, no worry. The only thing that they think about is this world as the be-all, end-all. And we see this example, for instance, in the Pharaoh within the whole of Quran. He's not concerned about his people. He's not concerned about his community. He's concerned about feeding his own ego. He's concerned about inflating himself toward demonstrating that he is the strongest and he is the most authoritative and that he is God incarnate himself walking on this earth. These hearts have become so hard that they're unable to ever remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second type of heart that God mentions within the Quran is the heart that is ill. That these hearts are the hearts of sickness. But what's unique is that God doesn't say that they will never be able to remember God. It just means that they're sick. And like we know that there's a cure. If God presents an illness within the Quran, he also has to present the cure. And again, the cure is God's remembrance in all of its manifestations that we'll talk about in just a moment. And the majority of people, they often fall into this realm. We're not always focused. We're not always motivated. We go through the ups and downs of you know, our lives and our days and our moments. Sometimes we feel more inclined to pray and to worship. And sometimes we don't necessarily feel that much. Sometimes we feel the desire to recite Quran and to supplicate and make du'a. And sometimes we're too preoccupied with doing things that probably are better served elsewhere. But again, the heart is sick, but it also again has that capacity to be a little bit more receptive. And then we're striving to where getting to the third heart that God mentioned within the Quran. He says, 
These are the hearts who approach God in a state of soundness, in a state of contentment, in a state of purity. Over here, God is referring toward the heart of the awliya, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who have dedicated themselves or have purified it or have emptied it of all vice and of all virtue, such that again, it only sees the creator. It only sees Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what we are seeking every single day on a day-to-day -day basis. But what are some of these hurdles? Why is it that our hearts often fall into that state of hardening or into that state of illness? I'll give you one or two. And then, of course, there are others, but we can save that for another discussion. Amongst the biggest reasons why it becomes so difficult for us to empty these hearts of all vice and to purify the heart the way that we ought to purify it is because, again, we love to put off responsibility, right? We love to put off responsibility. How many people, right? How many of you like to say, I'm sorry, when you make a mistake with somebody else? Nobody likes to do that. It's hard, it's difficult, but a responsible person realizes that when they make a mistake, they have to say sorry. But we love to push off and we love to defer and we love to give every single excuse why I wasn't wrong. That's much easier. And even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to this. He says that on the day of judgment, God will raise all of humanity and raise all of creation. And on that day of account, he's going to be gathering us all together and asking, why did you do this? Why did you do that? And most people are going to say, no, it wasn't me. Shaitan told me to do it. My friend told me to do it. I wasn't, it, was, it wasn't my fault. It was this person's fault or that. Until at the end of it all, we have to admit that, yeah, you're right. It was me. I'm so sorry. But if we just jump to that opportunity and take responsibility for these hearts of ours, for our actions and for our deeds, the opportunity to grow is that much greater. And I'll just open up this quick parenthesis for a moment. A lot of times people, they say, what does it mean when we say that shaitan is locked up during the month of Ramadan? How about all my sins? How about all the negative thoughts that enter into my mind? How about all the things that I say that I shouldn't be saying? How about all the actions that I engage in that I shouldn't be engaging? Shaitan has to have an influence, right? Isn't he the one telling me everything what to do? Isn't he whispering into my ears like we often like to say? No. Shaitan is locked up. That's just you. That's just me. That's just our hearts. We have to take account and understand that in the month of Ramadan, truly, we have been exposed to our own selves. So when the negative thought enters into your mind, when you get angry and lash out at people that you shouldn't be screaming at, when you treat someone poorly, when you look at someone judgmentally, when you have those internal racisms and microaggressions that you act upon people who are different than you, that's not shaitan, that's you, that's me, that's us. But again, it doesn't mean it's the be all end all that we give up. No, we see where there's room to improve and then we work toward fixing it. So what are these challenges and obstacles of the heart? Number one, responsibility. And number two, a lack of care and focus. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be amongst those who empty our hearts of all sin and all the transgression. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins and to allow for this month to be a month of blessing and a month whereby we are able to purify these hearts of ours. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa la sabina bi insani wa fi khus. Illa ladina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawassaw bil hakki wa tawassaw bis sab. Sadaqallahu alayhi wa sallam. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبين استعين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا والشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى محمد I advise myself and I advise all my sisters and brothers to have taqwa in Allah سبحانه وتعالى the hadith of the Prophet 
it speaks about this heart. He says, Al-Qalb haram Allah, la tasqun fi haram Allah khair Allah. He says that the heart is the sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't allow for anything to live in this heart other than God. How then, after mentioning all of this that we've spoken about, how then do we allow for this heart to truly be a place where God resides? Very, very quickly. Number one, to utilize this month of Ramadan and otherwise to consistently turn back toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To ask God for repentance, to ask God for forgiveness, to admit our faults, at least to him, Azawajal, and to also ask him to help us. We can't find spiritual success on our own. Many people, they think that it should be so easy to do so. It's not. What God wants us to do once in a while is humble ourselves in front of him, Azawajal, and say, oh Allah, I'm struggling. I'm having a hard time. I need your help. I need your assistance. And God cares about his creation. And he wants that for you. But he wants us to see where our obstacles and challenges are. He wants us to understand and admit that we have work and that we have areas for improvement. And once we make those strides, then we'll find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God himself, out of his mercy and out of his grace and out of his compassion, he will allow for the materialization such that we are able to reach that goal of ours, which is to know him, which is to fill our heart with his words. That's number one. Number two, to utilize these days in the recitation, but more than the recitation, in the contemplation of the whole Qur'an, as God says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran أَمْ أَلَا قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا That do you not contemplate this book or again, upon your heart, is there a lock? Is there something wrong with your heart that you don't once in a while think? When you recite on Quran, it shouldn't be just that we read, that we memorize, that's all good things, that's fine. But spend a little bit more time in reading the words and thinking about them, reading them and contemplating them, reading the translation if you don't understand the Arabic, and seeking toward recognizing exactly what God is saying to you at that very given moment. Quran is not a book only for the prophets. The Quran is not a book only for awliya. The Quran is not only a book for our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Quran is not only a book for scholars or whatever we often think. No, it's for every single one of us. And sometimes all it takes is one line for it to influence our heart and give us that inspiration that we need. A third thing is to make sure that during this month that we're utilizing our nights. We're utilizing our nights in communion, with the Lord of the worlds. There's something really beautiful about praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala under the stars. When everyone else is sleeping, when people, especially during the month of Ramadan, they spend time with family and friends and that's all good and you should be doing all of that. Spend a portion, even if it be five, 10, 15 minutes, you and the Lord of the worlds, whereby you communicate with him in prayers, in supplication, in dua, you speak from your heart to him and you will find that his light will enter into yours in ways that you could have never imagined. These are the days and these are the nights where we don't get them back. So we got to make sure that we're utilizing the opportunity when we have it. And this heart again that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us is too great, is too important, is too vital such that we waste the blessing and the capacity and the potential that it has. But it requires a lot of focus and it's difficult and it's challenging. But through our effort, through our obedience, through our worship, through our month and through God's support, we're able to allow for it to be receptive to the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and truly know God in the way that Ali Ali Salam mentioned that he knows God. When he tells that man again, like I mentioned earlier, Oh man, oh my friend, how can this Ali worship a God that he does not see? But I do not see him with the sight of my eye, but rather I see him with the faith of my heart. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this day of Jamaah 
and on this day within the holy month of Ramadan, to again allow for our hearts to be receptive to Him as our judge. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins and to remove all of our transgressions and empty it of all vice and fill it with virtue, of beauty, of love, of mercy, of compassion, of justice, of patience. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to be able to ascend during this month toward our highest potential and to allow for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to create love in our hearts and respect for others. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're able to make benefits of the nights of Layal al Qadr and take benefit from the recitation and reflection of the whole Quran. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahumma ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala al-Tahirin. A'udhu billahi min al-Shaytan al-Rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad. Lam yirad wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. Salakallahu al-Ali wa al-Adim. Wa sallallahumma ala Muhammadin wa ala al-Tahirin al-Tahirin.